So there is a, a clear example of dangerous, malicious, evil content getting up onto Facebook before it can be stopped because it's crowd posting and it's people are open to post and this is something broadcast live killings broadcast live um, I think it's appropriate to talk a little bit about the First Amendment um, we did talk about it in regards to newspapers you may remember so this is the first change the founders made to our original constitution and it involved freedoms freedom of religion freedom of speech freedom of the press the right of the people to peaceably assemble peaceably assemble <laughs> not what happened on January 6th in Washington by the way a little side note there um, so Congress can make no law abridging the freedom of speech so that was better defined by several court cases that reached the Supreme Court um, one of those cases maybe the most significant was called Shank versus the United States this is in World War One, where this fellow named Shank um, was picketing a line of men who were signing up for the draft for World War One to go into the army and he was the, I don't know exactly what his sign said but it was more or less uh, you know don't don't go die for your country don't sign up don't don't sign up for the army and he was arrested in the Supreme Court did indeed rule that he did not have the right to put that speech on a sign because the United States was at war and therefore his sign was a clear and present danger and if something is a clear and present danger the famous example of yelling fire in a crowded theater would present a clear and present danger you can't do that so the New Zealand mosque video is a is an example of something that is a clear and present danger and is not protected by free speech um, here's a recent uh, newspaper headline from the Washington Post owned by Jeff Bezos <laughs> owns Amazon um, Facebook is from time to time making some moves to control content they banned content from QAnon Whoop. for example QAnon is this wacky conspiracy group uh, involved in anti-government uh, protests and sharing false crazy rumors and propaganda about political figures it's just nonsense and it stirs a lot of people up with a lot of crap and Facebook has banned that and here they are now trying to do a little bit more with um, removing coronavirus and misinformation and folks a lot of people were convinced not to get inoculated and get the vaccine against coronavirus because of Facebook because of dis information it was shown that a major source of disinformation on Facebook was a so-called doctor I think he lost his medical license who was selling an alternative cure influencers by the way also need to be taken with a grain of salt even if they are a handsome young doggy in his fetching outfit named Doug the pug because influencers are paid to say what they say <laughs> so take those with a grain of salt too folks okay misinformation and disinformation particularly with social media another one with social media relates to uh, and phones relates to people having anxiety over 
the things they see on social media. Also, people being bullied on social media. Uh, so, this just talks again about how much time people are spending on social, uh, excuse me, on their phones. 13% um, of millennials spend over 12 hours daily on their phones. Average American, 5.4 hours on their mobile phones daily. Wow. So just think back. Think back, back. Last time you misplaced your phone for an afternoon or a day or a weekend, how did you feel? Did you feel like you were running out of air? <laughs> did you want to scream? Like this painting, which is called The Scream by Edvard Munch, or Munch, I'm not sure which. We're so used to having our phone for everything. How to tell if you could be addicted to your phone. This is from Healthline. It's a website. And some of us are. Some of us are, folks. Um, this is a film that's worth seeing if you haven't. It's on Netflix. The Social Dilemma. And this is basically about mobile phones, social networks. The combination can be a dangerous combination, particularly for teenagers and teenage girls who get so wrapped up in projecting a certain image or being like someone that uh, it has been shown from internal Facebook research that Instagram can make teenage girls have negative body images and can even lead to in some percentage to thoughts of suicide. This just came out with this young woman Frances Haugen who had worked at Facebook who got her hands on thousands of pages of internal documents including the research that showed that Facebook is itself aware that teenage girls have negative self-image. It's a problem. This now is being taken up by the United States Congress and there are going to be investigations into this. Whether Facebook's algorithms and how they set things up encourage people to stay on the site so they can see ads and staying on the site is unhealthy. Here's a headline from the New York Times very recently and of course Facebook has changed its corporate name to Meta it's still calling the product Facebook the other product Instagram, the other product WhatsApp but Facebook is going to be looked at for this issue also for the issue of being a monopoly were they allowed to buy too many potential rivals when they bought Instagram, when they bought WhatsApp was that the best thing for customers So now I'd like to talk, so that's the issue of social media and negative images. Um, so we've had the disinformation, now we've had negative images. Now we're going to talk about privacy and hacking. And the reason there's so much data about us is that versus any other kind of medium, we actually, our response is tracked. Our response is tracked. Whoops, I didn't really mean to do that. Hang on, everyone. Our response is, oh my goodness, where have I gone back to? We're going way back here. Oh, please, please, please. Please. Just bear with me. I wanted to make a dramatic point here. <laughs> Gosh darn it. All right, I'm going to go to text box. Whoops. <laughs> I'm trying, I'm trying everyone in my own way. Right? So when we see, when we see this, where is this? I'm just going cuckoo birds here. Okay, so guess what? So now I'm going to do this. Now I'm going to do this. We click. 
We click. And they hear back from us. We're the receiver. We produce an effect, but we click. And they know we clicked. Right? Okay? What that means is that there are data. There are data about us out there. Okay? Yes, we leave little impressions in the sand of the Internet. Every time we do something, every time we read something or buy something or enter information, it, the data are captured. Uh, datum is the singular. Data are the plural. And there are lots of data about us out there more and more and more. Our cell phones are tracked geographically. Uh, every time we click something, just think about what um, FIT knows about us in the student database, professor database. Right? Think about what Amazon knows about you, what groups you're in, Instagram if you're on Instagram. Sephora, if you shop at Sephora, etc., etc., etc. And the thing is that, oh my goodness, that's a scary person. Well, it's the right time of year for it, because that's, that's an actor playing Jacob Marley. The ghost of Jacob Marley, the partner of Ebenezer Scrooge from A Christmas Carol. <laughs> and Jacob Marley, you see the chain around him? And he visits Scrooge on Christmas Eve to tell him of the three ghosts that will visit the three spirits. He is dragging a long chain. It's the chain he forged in life of all his sins and unkindnesses. And so it is with us with our data. Because every time we visit a website, that website is allowed to put a little piece of information on our cookie chain. Then that's how we are tracked all around the web with cookies. That's how we are remarketed to. How many times have you shopped for shoes and then you don't buy them, you leave them in the cart, the shopping cart, and you go away. But the next site you go to, oh, an ad for those very same shoes pops up. A banner ad, a display ad. And this goes on and on and on. Why does this go on? Because the site that sells the shoes, called your site here, puts a little cookie on your computer, on your cookie chain, that tells every other site you visit that you almost bought my shoes. And it gives them the not your site, the ability to accept a banner ad from my site. And if if Susie clicks the banner not on my site and goes back and buys the shoes, not on my site gets a cut of the purchase. All because of cookies and data. Yes, money, 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 money. Now, by the way, Cookies from third parties are going to be disallowed by Google in 2023. And so remarketing will not will have to change and other things will have to change. So you should know about that as young marketing uh, geniuses. All right, so now you know. But until then, cookies and chains. This is the first ad that ever ran on a website. It's a banner ad that ran on Wired Magazine's website in, I think, 1992 or 1993. Mark Zuckerberg says when he founded Facebook, he wasn't sure how he was going to make money. He would somehow, but he did, really did not want to sell ads. That's what everybody else did. He didn't want to. He wanted to build the user base. And Sheryl Sandberg joined, and they started selling ads and using all the data they had about us to help the advertisers target their ads to us. 52,000 ways of slicing and dicing customers. 
52,000 segments for advertisers to pitch their products to. Yes.